I understand if you have something, if you're tired already and you have to leave, but whatever you have to do is okay. Uh, today, I'll go to the second slide, please. Uh, these were the three talking points that I have, that the monetary system violates the rule of law, that it's dishonest, and it will blow up. In the first part of this, I spoke about it blowing up, but I think you can see the whole thing is unstable. And even your leaders tell you it's falling off a cliff. What I want to focus on now is the fact that it's not in accordance with law. It's really a little takeoff on the stuff that Ed Vieira mentioned. But most important, I wanted to concentrate on how and why the whole system is dishonest. Go to the next slide, to slide three. A lot of folks raise the issue, well, if everything we say is true, how come we don't read about this in the major media? How come it's not on television, the newspapers? Uh, how come we don't hear about it? Well, it turns out that not everything that's important gets into the media. And by way of example, there was a 50-year period in my life where you could not get anything printed in the major media or television or radio having to do with the health hazards of smoking. That was off the agenda, even though arguably smoking was killing half a million people a year. In a similar way, you don't hear anything bad about the dishonesty in the monetary system, or you don't hear anything about the lack of stability in the monetary system, and especially you don't hear anybody attacking the legitimacy of the monetary system. That's off the agenda. But you hear discussions, are interest rates too high or too low? But nobody gets to the fundamentals, and we're going to do that today. Go to the next slide, slide four. Second issue sometimes people raise, well, how come we didn't study about this in college? I mean, how come our professors didn't tell us? After all, they have tenure, they could say whatever they want. Well, the guy who put his, his finger right on this again was John Kenneth Galbraith in his book, Money Whence It Came, Where It Went. And he says, the study of money, he's not talking about all the areas in economics, but the study of money above all other fields in economics is one in which complexity is used to disguise truth or to evade truth, not to reveal it. Now, we have a word in the English language for disguising truth. It's called lying. So here you have the dean of the uh, economic profession telling you when it comes to the study of money, they lie. Well, why do they lie? They have tenure. They can say whatever they want. And the answer is uh, virtually all monetary economists have been compromised by prizes, by endowed chairs, by honorariums, by research grants, what have you. So for example, the so-called Nobel Prize in Economics, that's not one of those prizes that was endowed by Alfred Nobel in 1901. No. That prize came in 1968, and the endowment is the Central Bank of Sweden. And the real name of the prize is the Bank of Sweden Prize in Economic Sciences in memory of Alfred Nobel. It is a bank prize, and they don't give that to someone like Marty Rothbard or anybody who's going to challenge the legitimacy or the honesty of central banking or irredeemable paper ticket money. They give it to people who at least don't question it, and it's best for them who champion it. Go to the next slide, five. So where are we headed with this? Well, with no exceptions, the history of legal tender, irredeemable paper ticket electronic money is that its purchasing power always approaches its cost of reduction, which is zero. There are no exceptions. Next slide. This is seen from Hunt in the 1940s. And that stuff that guy is sweeping down into the sewer, that is the paper money of the day. Literally, lifetimes of the savings down the sewer. Is there a problem with the audio of this, Steve? And here they're burning the paper, next slide please, seven. They're burning the paper money for heat. More value, heat than you value than nominal value. And slide eight, and here these kids are playing with stacks of the paper money, playing with the stacks of paper money. This is a picture, slide 10, uh, just appeared in the Spiegel, it's an important German magazine. And here this woman is burning the paper money to eat her food. Go to slide 11, and here they're weighing the paper money. So the paper, the paper is worth more than the nominal value at slide 12. And this is a, a recent scene from Zimbabwe. And here this guy is buying lunch with the paper money, like it's a big joke. In the next slide 13, this is an example of a $10 million note. And I don't know if you can see it on your screen, but it expired. It's a $10 million note, it expired. Go to slide 14. These folks came out with a $100 billion note. What are they thinking? I mean, all these guys, they went to the London School of Economics, they went to Princeton, they went to Yale, they come out with a $100 billion note, go to slide 15. Well, $100 billion is not enough, let's go for $50 trillion. This is, this is the actual money that they issued in Zimbabwe just recently. And if that's not enough, go to the next slide, $100 trillion note. 
I mean, this is the way it comes. And when the money collapses, go to slide 17, it collapses generally over, in, you know, overnight, and people realize that the paper money is kind of worthless. They rush down into the street and like a swarm of police. They buy anything they can. So forget about this business of being able to sell your stocks, being able to cash out your bonds and buy something. It happens literally overnight, generally over a weekend. Slide 18. These are some of the countries that had currency collapses in the 20th century up until 1998. And some of these countries had multiple currency collapses. So this is something, and, and ask yourself, why is our irredeemable paper ticket money different from the irredeemable paper ticket money in Hungary? I mean, the Hungarians are one of the most intelligent people on the planet. There's more Nobel Prize winners per capita from Hungary than any other country. Interestingly, slide 19, Alan Greenspan, former chairman of the board of the uh, governors of the Federal Reserve, gave a speech dealing with a lot of these issues that I've raised pre previously. Uh, trouble with this speech is, number one, it was in Belgium, and nobody on this side of the ocean covered it, to my knowledge. Secondly, the whole speech was in that uh, jargon that he used, this uh, 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 Fed speak, and you had to really know what the vocabulary meant to understand it. So I wrote this little book to explain what he was saying. And in effect, he explained how we subsidized the banks and we had a, a commodity money like gold, the possibility of collapse would be virtually impossible. Talked about how the system, uh, if they bail out the banks, will only encourage them to make a more leverage. Later on, I spoke to him about uh, this talk that he gave. And I said to him, well, you know, this is really important. Why don't you talk about this more? And he said to me in a very dejected way, looking at the ground, shaking his head, he said to me, nobody wants to hear it. And the truth is, I don't know if you folks want to hear it, but the fact is, the whole system is, is not only a fraud, as you'll see in just a minute, but it's blowing up. And the next slide, slide 20, there's only one politician at the national level who talks about this issue. That's our hero in the Congress, Dr. Rod Paul. And he, it, Uh, my old friend Larry Parks has done the nation a valuable service by exposing how even Gallant Greenspan, the man behind the curtain in America's monetary house, knows that the Federal Reserve is an unaccountable bureaucracy that enriches special interests at the expense of working Americans and our nation's economic society. I highly recommend this work to anyone who wishes to understand the dangers of our fiat money in the system and the reforms necessary to ensure the dollar is once again as good as gold. So again, Ron Paul's the only one who's on this. And if you want to learn about this, uh, go back to slide to slide 19. Uh, this book, by the way, it's, it's a real easy read. You can read it in a couple of hours. It's a free download of the Fame website. If you don't want to print it out, you can get it from Barnes and Noble. It's only uh, $13. Uh, 21. This guy in the world, his name is uh, Jeffrey Garden. He was the Undersecretary of Commerce in the Clinton administration uh, of the uh, Yale School of Management, uh, has written five books, sometimes author for Forbes magazine, member of the Council on Foreign Relations Committee, an establishment figure. He is not some left-wing or, or, or uh, newsletter writer, writing in an establishment publication, the Financial Times, the title of the article was, We Must Get Ready for a Weak Dollar, and here he says, Washington will therefore have little choice but to take the time-honored course for big-time debtors print more dollars to value the currency and service debt in ever cheaper greenbacks. In other words, and this is the key phrase, the United States will have to camouflage a slow motion to fall because politically it's the easiest way out. And the way they camouflage that slow motion to fall is to phony up the uh, CPI, uh, and that's really part of the fraud. And go to the next slide. And Paul Volcker used to be our chairman of the board of the Federal Reserve before Greenspan, still one of the leading lights of the monetary authorities. He gave a speech at the Economic Club in New York a, couple, a while ago. I was there. And he said in this speech, he said, the new financial system has failed the test of the marketplace. These guys, the monetary authorities, they know the system has failed. And yet they're trying to save it. And the reason they're trying to save it is because the rewards to them have been so great. And now I want to segue, slide 23, I want to segue into the fraud. And I'm going to give you some examples of the fraud uh, misrepresenting the clear statements of the founding fathers and one other president. And then I'm going to tell you a story about Thomas Jefferson, which will give
need to understand the visceral hatred that the founders had for the irredeemable paper ticket money. So one re way to get these people to, or our people to accept it is to give the bogus money a patina of legitimacy by implying that it had the imprimatur and endorsement of the founders and presidents when in fact they all condemned paper money. Go to slide 24. And here's a statement from Thomas Jefferson. He says, paper is poverty. It's only the ghost of money and not money itself. He said, but its abuses are also inevitable. And by breaking up the measure of value makes a lottery of all private property cannot be denied and slide 25. And here, even though Jefferson condemned the paper money, they put his, uh, his image on the $2 bill as if he might have endorsed it. Now that is a misrepresentation. And go to slide 26, please. And George Washington, the founder of our country. So he writes, he says, other states are falling into the very foolish and wicked plans of emitting paper currency. Foolish, in other words, stupid. And these people weren't thinking in economic terms. They were thinking in moral terms. They wanted a moral, honest government. And they, he said, like Washington said, that the paper money was wicked. It was evil. And go to slide 27. Next slide. And here he writes, it says, other, other states are falling into, oops, excuse me, I got myself confused there. He says, paper money has had the effect in your state will ever have to ruin commerce, oppress the honest, and open the door to every species of fraud and injustice. Washington recognized that the paper money was a fraud and unjust. He got a slide 28, and here you see George Washington's picture on the paper money as if he would endorse it. Again, another misrepresentation. In slide 29, James Madison, the father of our Constitution, here he writes, Federalist Papers, he said, paper money is unjust. So again, they're thinking in moral terms. The creditors of illegal tender, the debtors of not illegal tender, by increasing the difficulty of getting specie, it is unconstitutional. And this is the father of the Constitution telling you that if you have paper money, it is unconstitutional, for it affects the rights of property as much as taking away equal value of land, Go to slide 30, and here you see James Madison. Because at the Constitutional Convention, they were amending, excuse me, they were supposed to amend the Articles of Confederation, which had uh, authorized the uh, government to issue paper money, nor ever hereafter be, be employed, be in its nature pregnant with abuses, and again, the key words, liable to be made the engine of imposition and fraud. See, if Alexander Hamilton telling you that if you have paper money, it's liable to be made the engine of imposition and fraud, holding out temptations equally pernicious to the integrity of government and to the morals of the people in slide 32, and here they put Alexander Hamilton's picture on the paper money. So again, in every case they've misrepresented, the monetary authorities of our day have misrepresented the very strongly stated positions of the founding fathers in slide 33, Andrew Jackson was not a founding father. He came in 1832. Uh, he said it's apparent from the whole context of the Constitution, as well as the history of the times which gave birth to it, that it was the purpose of the convention, that's the Constitutional Convention, to establish a currency consisting of precious metals. And then he goes on, slide 34, to exclude the use of a beautiful medium of exchange, such as certain agricultural commodities, at one time things like tobacco, for a legal tender, recognized by the statutes of some states as a tender for debts, and the still more pernicious, pernicious expedient of paper money, and then slide 35, and here you see they put Alexander Hamilton's, excuse me, Andrew Jackson's picture on the paper money. Go to slide 36, and now I want to tell you the story about Thomas Jefferson, which I doubt any of you have heard, and my source of it is this wonderful book, the subtitle of the book should have been the uh, title, Principle and Interest, uh, Herbert Sloan, the author, is the head of the history department at Barnard College at Columbia, one of the country's most preeminent historians. So it seems that Jefferson was married to a woman whose father, John Wells, was one of the richest men in the colonies. And he made his fortune primarily from slave trading, and he was also a large plantation owner. And John Wells died in 1773, and he made uh, Jefferson and his two brothers-in-law the executives of his will. In those days, and today as well, uh, well, I'm skipping ahead. 
He left at an, an enormous estate. Uh, the assets were worth something like 20, 30,000 pounds consisting of slaves and plantations, and the liabilities, which were roughly 11,000 pounds, was money that he owed to financiers in Britain. Then, and today as well, if a uh, executive distributes the assets of an estate without settling out the liabilities, the executive becomes personally liable for the liabilities. Personally liable. But in this case, the assets were so much greater than the liabilities. Besides, his two brothers wanted their share. Jefferson felt comfortable in disposing of the assets. Now, in those days in Virginia, people didn't have the money to buy such an enormous amount of slaves and plantations. And the way they effectuated this kind of transaction is what we call today seller's mortgage or vendor financing. In those days, the terminology was that the buyer would issue to the seller, Jefferson, a bond, and over time they pay off the bond, and that's exactly what happened. However, in 1776, the revolution started, Virginia issued paper money, the paper money came worthless, and the people who owed Jefferson the uh, 30,000 pounds of the, on the paper money paid him off with the worthless paper. But Jefferson still owed the money to the financiers in Britain, and in the rest of his life, he was never able to work his way out of that debt. He died a bankrupt. They auctioned off his, his possessions at Monticello. And so when Jefferson said that the paper money was a cheat, he wasn't talking about something from an economic point of view. He had actually been cheated, and big time. And so had all of the other gentry in Virginia, including James Madison, who was a very large plantation owner. Madison saw the revolution coming. He leased his land. And the people to whom he leased it paid him off with the irredeemable paper ticket money that was worthless. And the same thing for George Washington. And so when they went to the Constitutional Convention, by now uh, Jefferson is off in France as the ambassador, they weren't supposed to write the Constitution. They were supposed to amend the Articles of Confederation, which were thought to be defective because it didn't give the general government the power to tax. And what they did is they used the articles as a template, and they went down the list uh, item by item. And when they got to the part where the Confederation was able to issue paper money, or the bidding bills of credit, it was debated and with overwhelmingly rejected. So at the Constitutional Convention, they rejected the government to issue paper money, and they wrote Article 1, Section 8, the next slide please, 37, and it reads the coin money, not to print it, and to regulate the value of at the foreign coin. And then in article, uh, and then in slide 38, um, this is what Vieira just quoted to you. They said, no state shall coin money, admit bills of credit. Admit bills of credit is the term for printing money or make anything but gold and silver coin a tender in payments of debts. So with, without question, the Constitution requires gold and silver as money. Go to slide 39. And the question that comes up, well, why? Why gold and silver? Why not something like uh, tobacco, which they had used before, or copper or something else? And the answer is that gold, and at the time also silver, minimizes the transaction cost of transferring wealth over time. And so virtually all of the gold in Seven Mine, today it's about 160,000 tons, still exists above ground. It's the only commodity for which there is more than a year's worth of product above ground, with the exception of silver, which today is an industrial metal. Go to slide 40. So back to the misrepresentations. So how do, again, how do you get people to accept a legal tender well, in other words, you should misrepresent the definition of a dollar, and you redefine it, de facto, from something of value to something of no value. Next slide, 41. This, by the way, I want to give credit to Dr. Vieira. He's the first one who brought this to my attention in a very good way. The question is, what is a dollar? May the Congress make the dollar anything it wants? May it make rotten tomatoes or, or banana skins dollars? You go to slide 42, and it turns out that the dollar is mentioned twice in the Constitution, but it is not defined in the Constitution. It's mentioned in connection with the slave tax, which is no more. Much more importantly, and relevant today, it's mentioned in the Seventh Amendment, which guarantees you a right to a trial by jury for any dispute, $20 or more. Now, if the Congress could redefine the dollar, that means that the Congress could redefine the Seventh Amendment, which is ridiculous. And in fact, for the Seventh Amendment to have objective meaning, the word dollar has to have objective meaning. So what is the Constitution talking about when they talk about a dollar? Go to 43, and they talk about the Spanish mill dollar. The Spanish had built, uh, had built mints all over the colonies, and the uh, Spanish mill dollar, sometimes called the real or the piece of eight, uh, was ubiquitous, it was legal tender in a bunch of states. That's what they're talking about. 
And further evidence for that, slide 44, this is an example of the paper money issued by the Continental Congress to uh, finance the revolution. They were called Continentals. They went ruthless. I don't know if you can read the writing where you are. It says, the bearer is entitled to receive 50 Spanish mil dollars. That's what they're talking about. And then slide 45, here we see the first uh, legal definition of a dollar, but all uh, written by Alexander Hamilton, the Coinage Act of 1792. And here it defines the dollar in units, each to be the value of a Spanish mill dollar. What's the value of a coin? Well, they're not talking about the purchasing power. The value of a coin is its specie content, its gold content, or its silver content. And here he says the value of a Spanish mill dollar, the same as now current, and to contain 371 grains and quarter parts of pure silver. So that's the definition of a, a dollar. He couldn't change the definition because if he did that, all of the contracts that existed at the time would have required a different amount of silver. That is the definition of dollar and try 46. And this, this definition has never been changed. It cannot be changed. There's no such thing as a gold dollar or anything else or a Federal Reserve third note dollar. That is the definition. Anything else is a misrepresentation. And by definition, a misrepresentation is a fraud. Go to slide 47. Well, sometimes the misrepresentations are not enough. Sometimes you need strong, stronger measures, and the stronger measure in this case is the coercion. It's called legal tender. Now, if you go 48, everybody at the time of the revolution knew about legal tender because everybody had suffered with the irredeemable paper ticket. And Thomas Paine, sometimes referred to as the father of the revolution, he wrote a pamphlet called Common Sense. Everybody had read it at the time. And in his writing, he's talking about tender laws of any kind to operate to destroy morality. So again, the founders wanted a moral system and to dissolve by the pretense of law but ought to be the principle of law to support reciprocal justice between men and men. And now he's talking about the punishment of a member of Congress who should move for such a law ought to be death. I mean, this is how strongly at the time people understood about the coercion of uh, irredeemable paper ticket money. They thought any congressman, any lawmaker who opposes legal tender ought to be put to death. Now, the money of, of our country after the revolution was all gold and silver. And that remained, in, in fact, until the Civil War. The Civil War was a very unpopular war. Lincoln had trouble financing it. The Institute of Income had enough money. People didn't want to pay it. They raised the tariff, or the Merrill tariff, to 47%. Uh, again, didn't bring enough money. And they couldn't borrow the money because it would have popped interest rates, some say as high as 20, 30 percent. Uh, the banks in those days, their portfolios were full of bonds. If the interest rates went up, the bonds would have come worthless. It would have bankrupted the banking system. So what do you do? Go to this, uh, this next slide, 49. Uh, Lincoln had this very brilliant secretary of the Treasury. His name was Simon Chase, uh, one time aspirant to be president himself. Well, he said, well, we'll just print it up. And how do you get people to accept it? Well, we'll make it legal tender. We'll force them to use it. And this is an example of the legal tender note of the time. And you can see at the bottom, I don't know if you can read it on your screen, it says this note is a legal tender. And as you might imagine, this created a lot of controversy at the time and a lot of litigation. And after the Civil War, as Sam and Jesus is the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and this litigation percolates up to him. And it's up to him to decide whether or not what he did as Secretary of the Treasury was in conformity with the Constitution. And the first case that came to him was called the Griswold versus Hepburn case. He says, there is no legal power. He says, we did it as a war measure out of necessity, but the war is over. We got to have gold and silver as money. But there were only seven members of the Supreme Court for that decision. And they packed the court with two more uh, Supreme Court justices who had ties to the railroads. And now another case came up called the Knox versus Lee case. And now they said there is a legal tender power, not because of anything that's in the legislative history, not because of anything that's in the Constitution, which is the only thing it was supposed to look to, but because they said other countries could do it. And there's a dissenting opinion now. In, uh, in this case, a slide 50, Sam and Chase writes, you can look it up on the internet. It says the legal tender quality of money is only valuable for the purpose of dishonesty. Of dishonesty. And the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, who knew all about this issue, and to force people to use bad money. How's that for a misrepresentation? 
Now, the one group in society that was onto this virtually throughout the entire 19th century, especially at the end of the 19th century, but it's like 52, was the American labor movement. And they said, this is the right, right question, they said, you don't need legal tender to force men to take good money. The only use is to make them take bad money. And they also said very, very accurately, they said, if the money's good, why do you have to force people to use it? And if the money is not good, why should you force people to use it? Go to the next slide, 53. Now I want to talk about, very importantly, fraud and the basic banking relationship. Slide 54. Even though gold was the money, gold coins did not circulate in the East. They did circulate in California and for these four reasons. First, gold is a soft metal and the coins wear out if you pass them around. Secondly, it's very heavy. It has a specific gravity, 19 times heavier than water. So if you had some gold coins in your pocket, eventually your pocket would rip, you'd lose your money. Thirdly, the gold coins are too valuable, as Ed Guerra pointed out, for small purchases. And especially, gold coins are liable to be stolen. So the remedy for that is that people would take their gold coins to a safe place, usually a bank, because the bank had a big vault, and they would get an exchange. Next slide, please. A bank note. In this case, the United States note, which was not $20, it's a promise to pay $20. So I don't know if you can read the writing, I, I duplicated it on top. It says, this certifies the have been deposited in the Treasury of the United States of America, payable to the bearer on demand, $20 in gold coin. It's not $20, it's a promise to pay $20. 56. Turns out people not take their, uh, uh, their uh, promissory notes to the bank to get their gold. Why did they do that? I mean, what are you going to do with gold once you have it? So what would happen is people would leave the gold in the bank and they pass around the banknotes. And so what the banks would do, when they make a loan, instead of loaning people gold, they would loan them banknotes payable for demand in gold for which they did not have the gold. You got that? The issue is just like that example I gave you in part one where they're making a book entry. So here they're not making a book entry. They're giving people a piece of paper which they tell them is, is payable on demand in gold to which they didn't have the gold. Now the jargon for this is called fraction reason of lending. This is flat out dishonest. Go to the next slide. And this is really an amusing part, but this is the major fraud which about now. This is misrepresenting that these promises to pay have not been defaulted. So you've got a slide 58. This is a United States note. And I don't know, again, if you can read the writing. Uh, it says, uh, it's a, it says uh, payable to the bearer on demand one dollar. It is not a dollar. It's a promise to pay a dollar. You see that? What is a dollar? Go to the next slide, slide 59. That's a dollar. Then, slide 60, they break the promise to pay. So now you have a broken promise to pay a dollar. And now, miraculously, when you take a sign that's in fact, go to slide 62, and you hang it on the door, go to slide 63. Dog and, you, and you stamp it with a dollar. You gussy it up with seals and signatures. Does that make it a dollar? And then go to slide 64. If the Congress passes a law, it says, from now on, all these are cats. Does that make them cats? The answer is no. So this is a major misrepresentation. They've actually fooled people, and people can't even get it through their heads that they've been fooled like this. It's embarrassing. So another metaphor I have, go to slide 65. You go to a restaurant, you check your coat, get a coat check, and they steal your coat. And you go back and present your, your coat check and say, I bought my coat. They tell you the coat check is a coat. <laughs> <laughs> It's not that Duck Parks. Duck Parks. I got to tell you something. There's some people that check their coats in out here. We need to check and make sure they're still there. Probably. The only difference that our money is gutsy up seals and signatures, and the Parker money is obviously plain. Interestingly, by the way, when Franklin Roosevelt seized the gold in 1933, his federal secretary, his name was William Wood, he said, he said, it's not a problem. They wanted to issue scripts. They were worried that people would have enough money in their pocket for small purchases. So William Wooden says, he says, well, it's not a problem. He says, we can always print uh, more. He says, it'll look like real money, even though it's stage money. This is the Secretary of the Treasury. Stage money was like play money that they'd use in a play. They wouldn't use real money. The Secretary of the Treasury said this, and it's in the Federal Reserve publication. So right from the get-go, 
They knew this was the wrong thing. And by the way, parenthetically, on March 12th, Roosevelt froze all transactions in gold on March 5th, his first day in office, March 5th, 1933. Seven days later, on March 12th, he gave his fireside chat, explains to the people why he seized the gold. And in his fireside chat, you can read it on the internet, he says, our money will not be fiat. Because even in 1933, nobody would have stood for just arbitrary paper ticket money. Now I want to segue into another small topic, 67. This is a question about what I call fraud at the Fed. So after Paul Volcker resigned from being the uh, 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 chairman of the Board of Governors of the Federal Reserve in 1987, he and his former Catholic partner, who was the uh, uh, chairman of the Bank of Japan, a man named Toyo Godin, gave a series of lectures at Princeton. And that series of lectures morphed to a book called Change Fortunes. This is an excerpt from this book. And so here, Volcker is saying, he says he would transfer money each month on the day before the reserves were added up, said so the Bank of Mexico, and take it back the next day. In effect, phoning up the balance sheet of the Bank of Mexico. He says our unease did not arise from any fear of financial loss, but because the window dressing, i.e., the misrepresentation, disguised the full event of the pressures on Mexico from bank lenders, from Mexicans themselves, is an out-and-out fraud. And if anybody did this in the business world, you'd go to jail. And uh, Volcker has the reputation that uh, not this man, this should awake of everybody, there's something wrong with the system. Next slide. So how is it, uh, slide 16, so how is it such mass malfeasance brought outright theft were able to reach such gargantuan proportions? Why did not so-called elected representatives protect us? Why did they not uphold and protect the U.S. Constitution as they have all taken a solemn promise by and this is half the reason. And it has to do, in effect, bribing of our elected representatives with what I euphemistically call campaign contributions. This data, by the way, comes from the Center, of, uh, Center for Responsive Politics based on the reports of the Federal Election Commission. So $1.7 billion from the financial sector to the 535 congressmen and the uh, executive, but it's like 70, plus another $3.4 billion for lobbying. So they got 3,000 lobbyists handing out money hand over fist to uh, so-called elected representatives, and in effect, they bought them all. And so just recently, uh, Dick Durbin, sitting senator from Illinois, says, uh, said, uh, it's on the internet, you can find the quote, he says, the banks own the Congress. Well, how do you own the Congress? And the answer is, you buy them all, literally with campaign contributions and all this lobbying and papers. I mean, the whole thing is just outrageous. Parenthetically, uh, Ron Paul, I think it's like eight, nine different congressmen now, uh, he tells me he never got five cents from the banks. No, no surprise there. Go to the next slide. And more to the point here, I'm close to the end of course, is that Paul Boga, kind of, it's not a nice guy, but he does have some smarts. He says the global economy requires a global currency, slide 72. And the open issue is what is that global currency going to be? Is it going to be honest money, quality of the Constitution? or it's going to be irredeemable paper tickets. But the next slide, if you have honest money, gold is money, you have stable interest rates. We don't have time you know, in this presentation for me to show you everything. You have stable foreign exchange rates. The whole thing is honest. You have no special privileges for banks. You have the rule of law. Most importantly, promises of future payment get kept. Whereas if you have irredeemable paper ticket money, interest rates are volatile, you have volatile foreign exchange rates, the whole thing's dishonest top to bottom. You have all these special privileges for banks, emergency powers for the, for the uh, politicians, including president, executive orders, but most important, the promises of future payment get broken. And the next slide, and so the solution for this, this is really in line with Dr. Dr. Vieira's, and is to turn the sovereignty of the money system to people. So in our, in our country, the way it's set up is that the sovereignty of the money, money system, the monetary system, lies with the people not with some cart banking cartel. If the people want more money to the system, they go mine gold, mine silver, take it to the mint, you know, free, free coinage, and then make it into coins. And the way you do this is you reassert the monetary powers and disabilities of the Constitution, and that requires the remonetization of gold and silver. This is exactly what Ed was saying. And the next slide, please. And these were the three points I promised, talking points I promised to give you. Demonstrated to you the system violates the Constitution, i.e., it violates the rule of law. I've showed you some of the misrepresentations, which are incredibly egregious. And in the first part, I showed you that the system will blow up. And next slide. 
And again, I'd like to end all my presentations with this line from the American Federation of Labor in the 1890s selection. Labor always recognized that sound money was to the benefit of ordinary working people. And the tagline was gold is the standard of every great civilization. And the very last slide, again, I want to encourage you to join the fight on its money. Uh, and I thank you again for the time. Uh, I very much appreciate it. And I, uh, uh, I'm confident that all of you are going to be right. And thank you so much again. Thank you, Dr. Parks.